everybody, David Shapiro here. So if you're a fan of my channel or whatever you're watching this, you've probably seen some of my polls pop up. You might not have seen it depending on if you're on mobile or whatever. Anyways, on the community tab of my channel, I'm always running polls because I, I, the reason I'm doing this is because I want to get a feel for kind of like where my audience is at and that sort of thing. And some of you will point out that like there's selection bias. And yes, I actually did run a poll uh, a few months ago, like saying like, do you know who I am? And some people are like, I have no idea who the hell you are. Um, but it was only like 5%. So like 90 to 95% of the people who see this poll are my audience. So if you're watching this, you're my audience. And this is kind of representative of your cohort. So um, I'm just going to riff on this for a while because uh, there's I was scrolling back through and I'm like, man, I've been running these polls for almost a straight month now. So yeah, let's just like get to know the audience and I'll kind of unpack what I, what my thoughts are and reactions to this kind of stuff. So uh, last night as I was getting ready for bed, I was like, you know what? I want to know if people like how they feel because when I talk about post-labor economics, for instance, um, most people are kind of on board, but some people are like, yeah, but like it's a really American thing to, to not want to work anymore. And so I was like, let me just like get a feel for how many people actually love their job. And so I just did a really simple distribution, so ranging from love it to hate it with, you know, kind of everything in the middle. And we have a plurality of like it. So a lot of people are commenting, they're like, you know, my job's okay. Um, a bunch of people, by and large, people that have said that they went their own way, that they're self-employed, they love it. Um, I can say the same thing. Um, it's been just over a year now since I quit my corporate job and like working entirely for myself and being self-directed. I work twice as hard as I have ever worked in my career. Um, and, but I work for myself, so I keep more of the reward. So yeah, that seems like a pretty, pretty interesting trend. A lot of people who say they dislike it or hate it. There's, I haven't seen a whole lot of comments of people saying like, you know, like kind of some of the anti-work stuff that you might see, but maybe they're just, you know, voting and moving on and not commenting. Um, but some people say that they don't like their management, which is pretty typical. Um, but I haven't seen a lot of fear or, or anxiety, which was really interesting. But anyways, so it's like, what, we got 20 and 30%. So just about 50% of the audience likes their job. And then the other 50, some of these people are unemployed. I know that there's a lot of retirees in the audience. There's a lot of students in the audience who aren't working. There's uh, stay-at-home parents who watch. Um, so almost a full quarter of people are, you know, not, you know, not in the, like, I have a capital C career um, kind of thing. And then you look at this and it's about, uh, what, 26% um, are unhappy with their job. So that's actually less than I would have thought. Like when you look out in the statistics of, you know, like anti-work and, and lying flat and stuff, you'd think that it's like 80% of people are about to like burn their, their office building down. Like if you remember the scene from Office Space, like I could, I, could, I could burn the building down. Like if you look at the internet, that's kind of what it looks like. But in this case, it's like, you know, 50% uh, are, are okay with their job. A quarter are not working and a quarter are, um, you know, like unhappy. So it's like, that's obviously not optimal. It would be a, a better world would be like a hundred percent of people like their job or whatever. Anyways. So that's the first one. Uh, the second one is, um, I was asking in the long run, should AI run the government or even run the world? And so this was like, you know what? I've been watching other uh, podcasters and stuff, and the conversation is really expanding. As people are coming to terms with the fact that we are creating AGI and that AISI is like probably not long behind that. And honestly, as I've talked about in some videos, and this wasn't even my idea. I got this from, from Connor Leahy and others. Um, there's probably not going to be much of a difference between AGI. It's going to be, the question is, is not going to be intelligence or capability, but it's more going to be how much does it cost? How fast is it? And how broadly is it deployed? And those are all more logistics problems rather than actual scientific and engineering problems. So anyways, so, so then I'm thinking like in the long run, like how should the world be run? Because I know a lot of you out there are in favor of like full on socialism or, or communism. Some of you are totally against it. And there's some polls on that. So we'll get into that in a little bit. But then I'm thinking like one of the fundamental problems with humans being in charge is humans are always the weakest link. And so it's like, what if we get humans out of the loop? And I don't mean like, I don't mean like machines are treating us like cattle. What I mean is like, what if we all interact with the AI and the AI takes everyone's, you know, uh, needs into account? And does all the allocation because it's like from an from a just a first principles information and data perspective, if the AI is smart enough and it's a million times smarter and faster than us, 
it could hypothetically manage everything. It could manage the economy and ensure that everyone gets what they want. Um, no, but then, then the you know question becomes economic agency. If an AI is deciding what you deserve, then that takes agency from you, and that's like that's kind of that's kind of dystopian. But some people would be fine with that. Some people are not so much about that. But honestly, the overall statistics of this, where almost a quarter said absolutely, the sooner the better. Forty three percent said sure when it's safe and proven effective. And so that's uh, all told, that's what, 65%? So almost a super majority, almost two thirds of people in the audience want AI to take over and run the world, at least when it's, when it's ready. And then of course we have, you know, se- only 7% were other. And then um, I, was, I was actually thinking that the, that the, the never camp would be larger, um, but you know, see, we have what, 27%? So just over a quarter of people um, say like, no, it's not really a good idea, but almost two thirds of the audience of you people watching this think it's a great idea. Now, this was like, some people were really deeply disturbed by this. Like one of the comments was something like, I can't believe how many people are just rushing to their own doom. You lemmings, you're going to run off the cliff or whatever. And I'm just like, whatever. Uh, we have holdouts. That's fine. But so I thought this was a very interesting statistic um, in terms of people that are like, yeah, hypothetically, if the AI is better than us and it has better reasoning and planning and better uh, understanding of morality and ethics and economics and theory. Why not? Like, let's do it. So I was like, okay, cool. Like I thought this was more of a fringe idea, uh, but y'all are coming around to it. So great. So the next one, this one, um, Wes, Wes Roth commented on this one. So I don't need to do too much. Cause I know, uh, you know, Wes Roth with all of his, you know, entire industry shocked and entire industry stunned or whatever. This one, this one was also a little bit polarizing. There was some really vitriolic comments on this one, but by and large, a lot of people agreed. Um, and I think, I think the people that disagreed, they don't understand about what I meant about user consent. Cause some people that disagreed, they're talking about like, well, you agreed to use this product. Yes, that's fine. And, and some people explain that like, okay, well, if you don't like using this product, go somewhere else. But when you're working in a place where there's very few options, like you've got Google and Microsoft and Anthropic and not a whole lot of other options. And Apple, I guess, is they're going to revitalize Siri. When you have some of these kind of more natural monopolies, it's not, it's not necessarily about what the EULA says. Yes, technically you agreed to that, but the, it's more of on principle. It's more of a, of a UX design principle or for a product manager's design principle where user consent is what's what really important. And it's honestly kind of surprising that they, that they um, have struggled with this. It's like all the tech people have mentally categorized AI as something other than just technology because Facebook, for instance, found out, you know, and Reddit found out, you know, just give, give power to the users, let them use the platform however they want. Just put more hand, more tools in the hands of the users you know, give them permission to delete their posts, to block people, to create groups, whatever. Like user autonomy is actually really important, but instead it's like, well, AI is just fundamentally different. Um, and so because they're coming from it in this, in this idea that AI is fundamentally different, then AI should set itself up as a moral arbiter. Um, and it's like, that's not really how society works. Like that is still centralized authority. Um, and we have agreed for the last century, at least in the West, that um, morality and ethics is up to the people, not up to central authorities. This is the point of nihilism and postmodernism, which is to destroy central authorities. And so anyways, 70, like a, a strong, like super majority agree, like this is wrong. Um, so again, I've spent more time talking about this than I needed to. Most of you are on the same page. A few people disagree, but what was really uh, interesting is only 6% are in the disagree camp, um, which is smaller than I would have expected. So the next one up is, do you like or agree with the digital superorganism of what we're building? And by the way, I've got a, a video cooking on what does the superorganism want? Um, and it was actually inspired because in part of this poll, because again, here we are over 75, almost 80% of the people uh, that responded uh, strongly agree with this view that like what we are creating, what we already have is kind of a digital superorganism. We have a digital superorganism, but it's still kind of low intelligence because um, the internet is kind of dumb. The internet is just passing data without really any judgment or or introspection or evaluation. It's just passing data, um, and it's it's passing data based on corporate interests, really, um, and government interests. But when we, the people, have more agency and autonomy um, by having AI that's operating on our behalf and in our best interest, 
all collaborating on the internet and trying to achieve other things. That's when we're going to have a smarter superorganism. So again, I thought this was more of an outlandish idea. And some people were rather, you know, aggro about this. Some people like you're building the Borg. And I'm like, well, yeah, but that doesn't mean that we're going to like forcibly assimilate people. Like you're already a member of the Borg collective. I actually ran the, the idea of the digital superorganism um, by some of the researchers that I know. And everyone's like, yeah, we're basically building the Borg collective um, in some form or another. But again, like unless you get Neuralink and, and say like, you know, cyber daddy, tell me what to do. Like you're still going to have your own autonomy, but you're going to be participating in a larger entity. So anyways, on the disagree, it was 14%, which is again, still less than I would have thought in terms of disagreement because, you know, yeah, you got 14% here, 12% here. So that's like a quarter of people are in the, are in the, you know, other or disagree, but almost three quarters or about three quarters um, exactly are in the like, yes, this is, this is kind of what's happening. Um, so that was, again, very interesting where we're kind of converging on some ideas because to put it into perspective, when I was running these kinds of polls like six months ago, 12 months ago, there was a lot less uh, coherence on this. And I, I could scroll all the way back, but that's I post a lot on here. But if you've been following me for a while or you just want to take my word for it or you don't have to take my word for it, scroll back yourself, you'll see that there's been a lot less agreement in the past on some of these things, which is why these numbers kind of surprised me. Um, let's see, scrolling down. Here's the next one. When will we get AGI? So this one keeps coming up. It comes up on Reddit. It comes up on my Discord where people are like, what is going on with OpenAI? Why is it that Sam Altman is constantly posting about God and spirituality? <laughs> and there's a few other people. It's not just Sam. And it's like there's this giddiness of the tech insiders. And there's this. there's also, to be perfectly honest, there's a little bit of... I don't want to say vanity, but it's almost like maybe self-importance or something where it's like, we are the saviors of humanity. You know, there were, it's kind of creepy when these, when these, you know, very uh, cloistered insular tech bros talk about God and AGI and spirituality all in the same breath. And it's like, well, okay, reading, reading the writing on the wall, it seems like they have AGI and there's, there's more and more posts. I just saw something on Twitter. It was shared um, on my, on my discord, like, uh, what was it? Someone said, like, look at the trademarks that have been updated. And so apparently a bunch of people are trademarking AGI related product names or, or company names or something. So like, OK, like writings on the wall. It's coming sooner rather than later. Now, one thing that I will say is just watching the patent office and watching the trademark office. There are people that try and plant a flag sometimes years in advance. So that's not necessarily the best uh, metric. But there's, if there's an uptick in people doing it, then that means there's kind of a gold rush to say like, Hey, you know, we're going to trademark Jarvis or whatever. I think I know Jarvis is already trademarked, but there's other products named Jarvis. So I'm not sure how they got around that without Disney suing them anyways. So 30, almost a third of people say AGI is already here. It's just in, achieved internally. Another 8% agree that we'll achieve it this year. There's a, a big chunk of people. Like if you look on Reddit and singularity and r slash AGI and stuff, a lot of people are saying like AGI 2025, ASI 2026. A big chunk of people are saying, you know, by 2030. Um, so that's why I've kind of compressed the timeline. So, so it's like, okay, we already got it. A third of people say we already got it. Another 8% this year. Um, and then another 50% say like 2025, 2026 at the earliest. Um, and then, you know, 15% just are like, no, whatever. <laughs> it's not happening. Uh, again, you know, overwhelming majority of, if 85% of people seem to agree that we're going to have AGI within the next, you know, by 2030, probably by 2028 or 2027, like it's sooner rather than later. And also one thing to keep in mind, and I don't often talk about this, but just because we have AGI, that doesn't mean that that's the end of it because AGI will continue to get smarter over time. It will continue to get cheaper and it will continue to get faster. Um, just as we make algorithmic improvements, economies of scale, uh, better hardware, better underlying hardware, and then uh, also those compounding returns that I talk about, where AGI is going to help us make more solar, more fusion. It's going to help make better chip fabs. It's going to help make better quantum computing. And all of those are going to uh, feed back into the positive feedback loop. And that's when we get the, the intelligence explosion that other people have predicted in the past. I'm probably preaching to the choir, but you get it. You get the idea. Let's see. And then, um, oh man, this one, I said, uh, you know, a million tokens with high precision Gemini and text to video with Sora. This was nine days ago. It feels like it was a month ago or two months ago that this happened. 
And then this was totally a joke. And so the biggest thing that I learned from this poll is that some of you can't take a joke. Um, most people get it, but some people just didn't. They were like so angry that it's like, oh, make a poll that makes sense. It is a joke. It's the internet. Um, okay. So next up, um, let's see. This was, oh yeah. So Sam Altman has his fingers in a lot of pies and open research is something, I don't know if he helped co-found it, but he's a board member. And so this is just another, another example of, you know, people doing UBI research. You might've heard in the news, like Republicans somewhere just completely voted against UBI. I don't, it was like Colorado or Utah or something, but anyways, there's a lot of UBI experiments being carried out across the world at the state level, at city level, and at federal levels in many nations. Um, and so I was just like, okay, let's see, like, what? let's take the temperature. What do people want to see in terms of UBI? And so only 11% said, totally against UBI, it should never be done at all. So again, this is smaller than I thought it would be, um, uh, given, given you know, my audience and past polls. Because in the past, it was like, it was almost equal. And if you've been around for a while, you probably remember where I ran some of these polls and it was like 22% for, 28% against, and another 20-something, and it was just like even, it was flat. And so I was like, okay, well, that, like nobody can agree. And so we're in this place of convergence. So now then we had 10% say like UBI, yes, just not too much. And so the reason that I included this is because part of the existing um, neoliberal theory is that you don't want to make people too comfortable because then they get lazy and decadent and entitled, which there is actually lots of scientific evidence to support that. And so there's a good, not just an economic argument, but a sociological argument to say you don't want people to be too comfortable because then they just become overly dependent on the government and then they lose their creativity, they lose their, they lose any motivation to be innovative and productive and entrepreneurial. Again, all of that is well supported by, by evidence, by human nature and that sort of thing. But at the same time, if people don't have opportunities, do you want them to be starving and miserable just by, ver by on principle? Like, so that's kind of a problematic relationship. And so the next level up was UBI uh, plus UBS, which is universal basic services. That's healthcare, education, maybe even housing, um, UHC, universal healthcare. Um, and then uh, the, then the highest model, which was almost had a majority, it had a strong plurality, was all of that plus decentralized ownership. So this is basically anti-corporatism, which is saying instead of instead of private entities owning all the corporations, and so instead of having tech billionaires and trillionaires, let's actually create ways of having decentralized ownership. Now, collective ownership and decentralized ownership is not the same thing as strong communism, where it's state ownership. I am fully and flatly against full state ownership, except in a few cases, such as natural resources, because it makes sense to have, you know, the sovereign power of the land to say, hey, actually, we own the coal and we're going to distribute the proceeds of selling this coal to everyone or this titanium or this lithium or whatever. That makes sense, like uh, like state owned land rights and that sort of thing. But owning ownership of the of the of the means of production, such as robots and data centers and that sort of thing. I don't really see any reason that that couldn't be decentralized and collective uh, ownership, particularly when you have AGI to help you manage it. Because um, then it's like, you know, chat GPT for CEO, right? Like GPT-5 could be the CEO. And honestly, GPT-5 is probably going to be smarter than most CEOs. I've met some CEOs in my local area. They're not always the brightest tools in the tool shed. Sorry to say. Now, I know that a lot of you in my audience are CEOs and a lot of you are very intelligent, um, but I'm sure some of you also know some like, you meet some people and you're like, mm, they're not, they're not coloring with a whole pack of crayons. So anyways, that's kind of my take that 13% were in the other category. So I don't know what they want. Uh, let's see. The next one is, oh yeah. So this, this was, this was the conspiracy theory time. So I was talking with a good friend of mine who is, he's one of the smart CEOs. So we were having a phone call and he was like, what is the deal? Like, why is there such a huge like disparity between what we know is going on, you know, because CEO like cares about the business side, constantly researching, keeping his, his nose to the ground or ear to the ground to like, you know, what's coming. And I was like, so here's my take. Here's why there is such a huge disconnect between what we know is happening and what is coming versus what the news is talking about. First is Overton window. Plain and simple, most people who are on the outside, they just believe what the news tells them. They believe what their family tells them and whatever. And so you remember even just a year ago, like a year ago today, we were only just starting to be able to talk about AGI 
without being ridiculed. Even Sam Altman has talked about this. And he talked about how like he was talking about AGI in 2015 and like just the like the anger that it would provoke from investors or competitors and like people would go out of their way to trash his name for wanting to work on AGI and it's like these are tech people. They're supposed to be innovators. So anyways, ChatGPT changed that. It changed the conversation and so just about a year ago the Overton window shifts. So now we can actually talk about AGI like mature adults. Uh, but the Overton window hasn't shifted quite enough to talk about, hey, what is actually the full ramifications of the fourth industrial revolution? You know, if we look at 200 years ago, if you were to tell all the farmers in rural France or, or rural America or whatever, oh, yeah, two centuries from now, almost nobody's going to be farmers. They would have laughed at you. They would have been like, yeah, whatever, like farming is difficult and and you, you get off my land, right? <laughs> you know, go away. But it, the the number of innovations like electricity and and computers and metallurgy and chemistry and everything that created the environment that we see today, like there's just so many steps between, you know, everyone's a farmer and almost nobody's a farmer. And so likewise, the same thing is going to happen, but timelines have been compressing. So the first industrial revolution happened over about 100 years, 150 years. Second industrial revolution was a still a long time, about 50 years. Third Industrial Revolution, that was only a couple decades. Fourth Industrial Revolution might just be a few years or about one decade. Um, so it's going to happen faster and faster. Um, so that was, the, that was the first reason that like people just aren't ready because they're not ready to have the conversation. Those of us that are in this audience, in my audience, like we're kind of more on the cutting edge because a lot of you that, that follow me and reach out, it's because you want to know what's happening. You want to know what's coming. And this is honestly like I know that I get some criticism sometime because it's like, yes, this is guesswork. I'm doing the best that I can. I'm, I, I actually kept track one day and I was like, I spend about six hours a day learning. So that means podcasts, conversations, books, audio books, um, other YouTube videos. Sometimes I jump on call with my fellow creators, but it's like, that's my full-time job is just trying to understand what is happening and what is coming, what is coming. There we go. Um, and yeah, it's like if I if I have to spend that much time every day just to understand what's going on, of course most people don't have that kind of investment or whatever. Uh, so then then this is where we get into the a little bit more conspiratorial landscape, and this is government interest and corporate interest. And so there's actually vested interest. There's entrenched reasons that you'd want to downplay the impact that AI is going to have from a government perspective. Thinking at a at a global perspective, America, China, Europe, Russia, whatever. They don't want to say AI is going to kill us all. They're going to downplay AI. So anytime someone says AI is not that big a deal, and then they get put on like, you know, CNBC or Fox News or, you know, the Pentagon talks to them or whatever. The reason that that is a helpful narrative is because they want to keep investing in the technology. It's kind of like whenever there's a beneficial technology like asbestos or nuclear weapons and you just downplay the risks. Um, they did the same thing with the pandemic. They did the same thing with inflation. You downplay the, 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 the negatives so that you can keep doing what you're doing. So this is geopolitical advantage. It's military industrial complex. There's all those kinds of reasons. And, you know, I'm not that upset about it because I've been studying, uh, propaganda. So if, uh, some of you asked, like when I mentioned that, like, who am I talking about? So Edward Bernays is the grandfather of propaganda, but then also Noam Chomsky has some really good stuff about like, it, it, it's all put together in a book called necessary illusions got a copy of it over there. You probably can't see it. Um, anyways, this is just how the world works. And this is because um, they, they actually said it in uh, Gladiator, you know, the Russell Crowe movie. The mob is fickle, brother. Like, people are easily distracted, right? It's just smoke and mirrors. It's a dog and pony show. Um, corporations also have this interest because they want to say, no, no, no. All the layoffs are happening because of lazy remote workers. All the layoffs are happening because we accidentally overhired during the pandemic, which may or may not be true. But what's happening now is some of them are saying the quiet part out loud, like UPS and Cisco. They're like, we're just pivoting to AI. Get over it. Uh, so that's that's kind of what's going on. And uh, again, the the results were actually pretty, pretty surprising to me. Um, 42% said spot on, 100% agree, this is accelerationist and malachy. Only 6% said they totally disagree. And then uh, 28% uh, partly agreed. So I was like, Okay, I guess I guess I'm not that off base then. That or we're all a little bit crazy. So uh, going back, oh, so here's the thing about the UPS laying off 12,000 employees, and so just again taking the temperature of the room. Uh, only 12% say technology always creates more jobs in the long run. 
um, uh, 56, so a, a majority, a strong majority, said many or most jobs are going away for good. Um, only a very, very small pe- percent of people said AI will never overtake most human abilities. Um, and then uh, almost a quarter of people were like, fully automated space luxury cos- communism, let's go. Yeah. And then 8% said something else. N- there's not a whole lot of comments on this one, so I don't really know what they thought something else was. But again, the numbers kind of speak for themselves. Let's see. All right, so next up. So this was another one that was surprising to me. So this is why I've been on a roll because like I, when I mentioned in some of my videos that like there's been a sea change out there, particularly in the month of February and late January, this is what I'm referring to is because, you know, I read uh, Max Tegmark's Life 3.0. A lot of you in the comments, you know, thanked me for talking about it and reminded you to go read it. So I think a bunch of you did pick up this book. Um, but anyways, in one of my videos over the last few weeks, I talked about how it really kind of feels like we're creating a successor species. And that led to the idea of the digital global superorganism. But anyways, so when I, when I said like, okay, are we creating a successor species? Because it's like, this really kind of speaks to the existential dread that some people have. But what surprised me most is that 44%, a plurality said, yes, we are creating a successor species and it's a good thing. So again, like, In my sci-fi book that I'm working on, actually, it's with the editor for the final pass, so I'll be able to announce a pre-release or pre-sale or whatever um, here soon. Like, I actually have a planet that actually has gone through this process and has a digital superorganism successor species kind of, you know, uh, arrangement. And it's like, okay, this seems like a logical enough, you know, course of events. If AI is smarter than us, maybe it should run things. And so then 44% of you agreed, like, yes, we're creating a successor species and it's a good thing. And I'm like, well, that's more than I thought. And then 16% said, yes, we're creating a successor species, but it's a bad thing. So it's like, okay, you know, this, this I think might be the doomers. This might be the, like the Eliezer, Yukowski and Connor Leahy people that it's like, we're creating something smarter than us. We will lose control of it and it will kill us. Like but that's only 16%. 30% were undecided or unsure. So that's other, but then only 11% disagreed that we we're creating a successor species at all. So vast majority agree, like we're creating a successor species for better or worse. And so I was like, wow, this is like some sci-fi level stuff that y'all are on board with. Okay, cool. And then, uh, let's see. So I think, uh, we're, we're, we're winding down. We're almost at the, at the end. Um, have you lost uh, a job to AI? So this is about the unemployment stuff. And so, you know, yes, I've been laid off because of AI. So that's 4% of you out there. And this was out of 6,000 votes. So do, you know, do the math. That's, that's quite a, quite a number of people. And then not me, but friends or family have been laid off due to AI. And so again, this could be like, why are these numbers not getting reported? And, but again, it's because it would be very inconvenient for the geopolitical narrative if people start being angry about AI, which is why, of course, you see like the protests at at the open AI office. Um, People are angry. Some people are angry and scared because things are changing. And what I mean by when I, when I say like, I, I understand people's anger and fear, like, yes, things are changing and uncertainty is going up. And when people like Sam Altman even say like, oh, the things that keep me up at night are like the sci-fi level stuff. And it's like, yeah, that doesn't really, you know, uh, stir confidence. Um, He's supposed to be the man with the plan. And it sounds like he's not the man with the plan. He's just, I'm just building the gun. It is what it is. But most interesting was 2% said, not me, but I've had to lay people off due to AI. And so I've, I've alluded to this in my own thing where like, I've tried to incorporate, I've tried to hire employees but I just can't justify the cost. Humans are so slow and so inex- and so expensive compared to AI. It's better to just use AI. And a lot of people in the in the comments that that said like more or less the same thing. They said I haven't laid anyone off, but I'm not hiring anyone else um, because of AI. And I've heard that actually from several places: um, small bit small businesses, medium businesses, and of course enterprise scale businesses. They are actively laying people off um, sometimes in the thousands. Uh, and then 40% said uh, they don't know anyone personally, but they've seen it in the news. And just shy of 50% said they've not seen any evidence of AI job loss. So again, this is a little skewed. I thought that I thought that it would be more on the other side, but you know, there there's a little bit of data here. Like it's a trickle now. Um, someone asked me, like, are we going to be all unemployed by the end of 2024? I don't think so. I don't think we're even going to be at 20% unemployment. You know, a year from now, we might be at like 5%, 6% unemployment by the end of the year. Um, and, but even then, I wouldn't be so, like the 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 margin of error there is like plus or minus 2%. We might be at the same same amount of employment that we are right now. Um, let's see what's next. 
this was uh, the, the channel name change. So I just went back to David Shapiro because a lot of you pointed out that it's just easy because you know me by name, you refer to me by name. And so it's just like, oh, you find David Shapiro, you find... I was like, all right, that's solid logic. So we just went back to David Shapiro. But tw- full, I learned a full 27% of you are trolls because Channel McChannelface had 27%. So I was like, okay, whatever. Then, all right, acceleration, deceleration, incrementalism or whatever... And uh, 52% accelerationism all the way. Now, I didn't differentiate between accelerationism and effective accelerationism, um, but only 4% were on the deceleration camp. So, sorry, Connor, like, you got very few people on your side here. Now, I will say that, like, I'm kind of on the, like, let's tap the brakes or, like, let's at least steer the boat, right? Um, so, I'm, I'm happy to report that 25% of people were in the incrementalism path, which is basically the difference between accelerationism and incrementalism is... Let's make an advancement and then assess and then make another advancement and assess rather than just go forward as fast as possible. And then uh, Dune reference here, 9% were on the golden path and 10% didn't care. Whatever. Uh, Let's see. Was that it? That might have been it. Oh, nope. Here we go. We've got some more. Um, So this was another another, uh, surprising one where because there's been a little bit more – you know, talk about like rejuvenation, longevity, demographic collapse, and those sorts of things. Um, I was really curious to feel to to feel out not what people predicted, but what people wanted. And so the purpose of this poll was um, to to say like, are you actively for something or passively for it or actively against it? And so what I mean by that is, if you're actively for indefinite lifespan, what I mean is that it's something that you that you positively want, and you're willing to put time, money, energy, or other resources towards getting it. And so almost 50% of people are actively for indefinite lifespan, meaning almost fully half of you are willing to put in time, money, effort, or some other resources towards making sure that you get indefinite lifespan. Now, uh, another quarter almost are just saying, if it happens, it happens, but I'm, I'm still for it. Only 12% were uh, neutral, and then 16% were against it in some respect. Uh, and again, there's arguments on both sides. Uh, argument uh, four is going to be um, economic reasons. There's uh, plenty of other reasons like, you know, uh, intergenerational patterns like the fourth turning, which, by the way, I'm reading that book finally. Many of you have talked about it, and it's actually a very compelling idea. And so you might you might slow down this intergenerational churn where you end up with, like, you know, one generation that's all gung-ho and the other one's, like, all F you and the other one's, like, burn everything down. And then the another generation's, like, I don't care. That's basically the four generations. <laughs> and so if people live longer, then you're going to have more generational wisdom and you're going to have those four archetypes all working together rather than, you know, one on the rise, one dying off, and so on and so forth. Another, you know, but against it is uh, concentration of power, concentration of wealth. Um, you know, they explored that in Altered Carbon as one of the most famous uh, TV and book examples of, you know, if people live forever, money begets more power and money and you're going to live longer and you're going to have all the toys and all the power and all the resources. And then you're also going to live longer so you can um, create a web of basically elites who are permanently elites. Biggest argument against as far as I can tell. But even so, if we can make indefinite lifespan achievable and affordable, Still, all, you know, strong majority are for it in some some form or another. Um, let's see. I talked about interviewing people. Interviews don't really do well on my channel. Some people make a career on doing interviews, but I think most most people just want to hear me talk. That's kind of like what uh, what people really kind of express in the in the data and the comments. Um, but yeah, so I think that's about it. I think that's uh, that's that's what we'll cover today. So thanks for watching. I just wanted to uh, go over the data. I've been meaning to do this for a while. But I keep running polls and you guys keep giving interesting results. Um, So, yeah, I hope you learned a lot about uh, your fellow David Shapiro watchers. Um, Yeah, and thanks for jumping in and participating. It's been a really interesting year. And I look forward to uh, keeping, keeping everyone in the loop as we go forward. Cheers.